The resistance is in all kinds of trouble. Oh yes. It don't dream of a great movement cranking up which is going to save the situation. Uh-uh. Think of uh, an emergent yes. Think of an emergency network, sort of network, sort of coordinating with contact and but it's it's chaos from now on in. I'm afraid so. Because the shepherd is struck and the sheep are scattered, and so the shepherd is the Pope. Uh, if Father Grun has a very interesting argument coming from Italy, uh, it may be that France, Pope Francis isn't Pope. But the same argument will argue that if Francis isn't Pope, Benedict still is. It's a possibility. It's something that Father Kramer has argued. Okay. So, even if we think that Pope Francis is off the wall, we don't, still don't have to be St. Vacantis because Benedict is there behind. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. God knows I don't know. I think many of us don't know. We don't need, strictly need to know because it's beyond us. And God doesn't expect what's from us what's beyond us. So, we have, our own, we have our Catholic lives to lead, we have a mortal sin to avoid, the state of grace to maintain, and death to die in the state of grace in. That's enough. That's a tall enough order. I wish I could say that the resistance is, is on a roll, it's great, it's magnificent, we're going to have tens of priests, dozens of priests, we're all going to be united. Ah, 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 ah. Don't kid yourselves. So, you're going to have priests that may come by, with a, I mean, Father Five, you know, is coming by with a certain regularity, but it's not a very great regularity. Uh, it's iron rations, as they say in the army. You know, you've just got to live, learn to live pretty much without a priest. I hate to say that, but that's the way it's going. The bad guys are in control. The bad guys seem to have won. They're on a roll. They reckon they've got the whole game in their hands. They're reckoning without God. They don't believe in God, or they don't take him seriously. But uh, they're gay, they, you know, Almighty God has not lost grip. And he hasn't resigned. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's got the number exactly of these characters. He's waiting for them around the corner. They don't realize it. But they'll, they're, they're not outsmarting him. So... Don't worry, but be prepared for um, worse and worse chaos. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's the prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament who says that the, the shepherd is struck and the sheep are scattered, and our Lord quotes him in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Passion. And of course, because it's exactly what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Our Lord was struck and the apostles scattered. And that's how it, that's, uh, the, sh the, the Pope is struck, really struck, struck mostly in his head. These, these liberal popes are nuts, from a Catholic point of view, they're just nuts. But it's a condition that God has allowed, and an, another concla any conclave today, of today's cardinals, is not going to elect a decent Pope who thinks straight. And if a Pope does, I was suggesting to you a little earlier, if a Pope does sort of begin to think straight, like it may well have been the case with John Paul I, they murder him. The, 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 the church, the, the, the churchmen won't take a decent Pope. The churchmen want a Pope who's going to do the will of men and not the will of God. Oh dear. Well, at least there's a future. <laughs> you can say to yourself, if there are babies, there's a future. And if there aren't babies, there's no future. It's as simple as that. And the Muslims are taking over England, France, and Germany because there aren't enough English, French, and German babies. The English, French, and German young people all want to go and tan themselves on the, the golden beaches all over the world with super cheap jet flights. They're not going to have babies because babies are a sacrifice. 
Babies oblige one to be selfish, uh, selfless. Babies oblige selflessness. And if I want to be selfish, I'm not going to have babies. And if I don't want babies, I'm going to drive my wife crazy because she's made for babies. And if I drive my wife crazy, she's going to go into the workplace and drive me out of it. And she's going to take over and she's going to dominate everything. Dr. White down the United States says the women are taking over in everything. The corporations, the army, the military. It is ridiculous, but it's the logical consequence of the young men not wanting children. If they don't want children, they're going to tie the poor women in knots. Because that's what the women are for. So we're in, we're in all kinds of trouble. From head to foot. And it's not going to get better until finally... Almighty God climbs in, intervenes, and he's going to intervene. We're heading for a gigantic chastisement. I, you know, there was a time in the human race when mankind was under the shadow of a great chastisement. Mr. Noah was building his crazy huge ship, landlocked huge, huge ship, and everybody was running, walking by and mocking, making fun of him. And then, you know, suddenly all of the animals from all over the world began, from all of them began climbing into the ark of peace. I mean, it, it got crazier and crazier. And then the Lord God shut the door, the scripture tells us, because Noah couldn't do it himself from inside. The Lord God shut the door on the ark, and then it began to rain. There was a time in the human race when everybody was making fun of the man of God. But he was right, and they were all wrong. They were our Lord, our Lord says they were marri hatching, marrying, and dis uh, hatching, matching, and dispatching. That's not our Lord's expression, but it's what you know. You know, it's, uh, famous, uh, but being born, married, and but and dying, just like normal. Everything seemed normal, but it was sick and crazy because it was it was it was against God. Like today, everybody thinks it's normal. It's sick and crazy, and the Lord God is going to intervene because otherwise, every single soul falls into hell which is what our Lord says. Unless those days were shortened, even the elect, if it were possible, would not be saved. That's where we're at. And so the days will be shortened, but until they're shortened, they're going to get worse and worse. It's clear. It's simply clear. So tighten your belts and get used to the idea of iron rations. And the iron rations, our lady said, some of you I'm sure know, many of you may know, she said the time will come when I will save the world with the scapula and the rosary, she said. I think she said it's St. Dominic, I'm not sure. Um, I will save the world with the scapula and the rosary. So if you don't know about the brown scapula, learn about it and get yourself vested in the brown scapula. Very simple, very simple little thing, ridiculous, completely ridiculous. Two little pieces of brown cloth with two brown strings. With a one clown brown cloth, ridiculous. But if heaven says that that's what's going to save us, that's what will save us. Just like the rosary. A little string with a lot of beads on it, ridiculous if you say that's going to save it. But if heaven says that's what's going to save it, that is what will save it. It's time to stop thinking like, like you know, the, president, the, the presidents of all our stupid Western nations. It's time to start thinking like the mother of God says. What she says is going to work. It'll happen. What the presidents say is just crazy. Except today, President Putin. President Putin is talking some sense of Russia. And he's saying, his latest speech is, Western statesmen, playtime is over, put away your toys. Let's start talking seriously about how to keep world peace and not have all this stupid talk racing towards war for the sake of madmen who want complete control of the whole universe. And Putin says that's a no-no. And he's not going to play ball with it, and nor is Russia going to play ball with it. And he and Russia are absolutely right. And our Western statesmen are crazy, sick puppets of madmen. That's where we're at. So, get used to it. It's tough, it's rough, but our Lord, uh, God is still in command. So the resistance, you are certainly entitled to pray for more priests. I wish you more priests. 
I'm not going to do anything to try to stop more priests, that's for sure. But I'm not going to be under any illusion that it's going to be me that puts together another SSPX. No way. It's, time is over. Put away, your, put away your toys, everybody, and get with it. Get, grow up. I'm being, speaking very brutally, but that's where it's at. Playtime is over. It's getting very serious. And when I say it's getting very serious, what wills, what wills to work? Pray the rosary. Pray the rosary. And I, I say to everybody, wherever I go, uh, five mysteries is, is not enough. It, 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 Fifteen mysteries. Um, watch and pray, watch and pray, 15 mysteries every day. There you have it. Watch and pray, watch and pray, 15 mysteries every day. Because playtime is over. I'm sure that many of you are aware that playtime is over. Well, 15 mysteries is not so difficult. If you've got 15 children, you're dispensed. <laughs> If you've got 13, well... <laughs> okay, has anybody, got any, has anybody got any more detailed questions than that? That's a, a, a broad and dramatic picture, but the situation is dramatic, for sure and so. Yes? Um, years ago, when you said Mary Lauder, you said Canadians are very forward, so I want to be very forward and ask some direct questions, two of them. Um, you alluded to a riff within the, the um, resistance, and I'm just wondering if, what the true deal is with Father Zondeas and Father Pfeiffer. And the second thing is, will, and it's been a question that a number of individuals have brought up, will you or are you considering consecrating another bishop? Huh. I thought that one of the two questions would be that. <laughs> Uh, will I be consecrating bishops? Uh, the thought has occurred to me. <laughs> Within the next ten years. But if it happened tomorrow, it would be within the next ten years. So if I say within ten years, that leaves me a certain liberty, okay? But maybe in today's circumstances, it's not the best thing for me to broadcast exactly what I'm thinking of doing, or when or where. So if you don't know anything about it, and suddenly you find that bishops are growing like mushrooms, <laughs> don't be surprised. <laughs> One of the questions was, if he was to consecrate another bishop or two, he might not make a public announcement until after the fact, as it will become too much an issue for you to deal with uh, a location or something of this nature. Too much, too much of an issue for a bloody-minded Brit. <laughs> <laughs> you underestimate bloody-minded Brits. Uh, but it's true that it might be wiser to broadcast the fact only after the event. Right. <coughs> it might be wiser. Yes. Um, your other question was Father Zendekas and Father Pfeiffer. Father St. Nicholas is here. Yes, I know. Maybe he would like to answer for himself. Father, would you like to say a few words about the situation between yourself and Father Five? Is, is the... Um, is a difference of work, but there's no a different principle. So that's why, absolutely, I ask me my dismissal out from the society, that's official. I, I am out. Took me for a while for different reasons. Yes, and I want to work together with the same calling that our church Lefebvre did in the crusade for priests. So my, my mind is in this um, crusade that our church Lefebvre asked for the priest, and also um, is a stand against the response of the three bishops later by Bishop Fleck that say publicly afterwards, the he didn't say that, but it was public. And the declaration, April 15, 2012, that explained exactly, spells out 
out exactly what's in each police mind, and also in the CNAS conferences. That's why, that's my position, briefly. And in, with Father Pfeiffer, we have different ways of work. He, he goes around. My main goal is to open the retreat house. I worked for 20 years. Everybody knows I worked for 20 years in the retreat house. So my goal is to have a retreat house because we have to encourage people and to enlighten minds what, what is the battle, what is the distinction of what we're supposed to do, and to refresh them or encourage them. So my, principle, my main goal is to open a retreat house. In that way, I cannot travel. Okay? Also, there will be more activities, but the time will tell you little by little how it will be. Fair enough? There are uh, Americans say there's more than one way to skin a cat. And there's more than one way to run a resistance. The church always had a large number of different apostles, which all complemented one another. Maybe the resistance is beginning the same thing, different apostles which complement one another. Pray that there be not too much infighting. But you know what poor old human nature is like. And, you know, we easily start fighting. Men are like cocks. We men are like cops. Yes. Uh, just a question. Uh, uh, your uh, view and you know, opinion and maybe a recommendation, and I hear this quite a lot, of people who are still with the society, yes. uh, including priests. And the law, the, it seems like the, uh, the common answer would be, well, I'm going to wait till there's an agreement signed. Then yes, that's that's right. I just want your recommendation on for somebody who still is in the society. What yes. would your recommendation be, or opinion, or your view on that? Right. It's a, I'd say it's a difficult <coughs> question. Certain. It's a question on which opinions <coughs> vary. Okay. So I don't think there's one right opinion. That that's my. I personally think it's like after the novice when the novice order came in. We're going to take yourself back to the 60, 65 to 70, 75. Some people saw immediately the new mass was rotten, they cleared out immediately, and they wanted everybody else to clear out. Other people saw it only after 10 years, somewhat more slowly. It certainly seemed as though the Holy Ghost enlightened different people at different speeds. That's what it looked like then. That's what it was like still now. I think you can say that still now there are decent souls, believing souls, inside the Novus Ordo who are still devoutly attending the new Mass on Sunday and who, as far as we can judge, are living in a state of grace. There are a lot of souls alongside those who are in danger of losing their faith day by day because of the slide which is built into the Novus Ordo. So on the one hand, you can very well say, everybody get out of the novice order. On the other hand, you can't say, everybody still inside the novice order has lost the faith. That, that you can't say. I've just been down in Mexico and Brazil, and it's obvious that even inside the novice order, even after 40, 50 years with the new mass, it's obvious that there's still faith inside the official church at the level of the people, and it must be also, to some extent, at the level of the priests despite all the dangers. So the, there is a built-in, given, given where the uh, leadership of the society is going, given what they say, given what they do, above all what they do rather than what they say. They're modern politicians. You've got to watch what they do much more than you listen to what they say. So they're, they're politicians that are at the top of the society. They're politicians uh, moving to the left while pretending to stay to the right. So they talk one way and they walk another way. Just like all modern politicians. Because in the modern world, the people want to go to the devil, but they want to pretend that they're still with God. Broadly speaking. 
And therefore you've got your, and it's this people that throws up these politicians who talk out of both sides of their mouth. It's the people's fault, not just the politicians' fault. We have the politicians we deserve. So it's something similar inside the society. There are too many people, too many lay folk and priests inside the society that no longer understand what Archbishop Lefebvre was about. Father just saying he intends, with the grace of God, to carry on what the Archbishop was about. He's understood the difference between what the Archbishop was about and what they are not now on about. There's a big difference. So, uh, I don't think, I, would, I do not say to everybody inside the novice order, priests or laity, I don't say, you've got to get out. What I do say is, there is a very serious danger of your being poisoned by a poison which is coming steadily and from above. And it's, it's very poisonous. It's, it, it's, it gives you the idea that the new church is all right or that going along with the new church is all right, which is more or less the same thing. It's okay for us to be heading back into the conciliar church. Oh, they don't say it's the conciliar church, of course. Oh, no, 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 no. It's okay to be heading back. We're going back into being Catholics in the mainstream church. We want to be Catholics again. That's what they feel. They're going by their feelings. If they use their mind, they're just like Archbishop Lefebvre, they realize that the structure is empty of one holy Catholic and apostolic. Wherever you've got one holy Catholic and apostolic, you've got the real church. And whether it's inside or outside the structures, that's how to tell where you've got the real church. And you haven't got it inside the structures. The structures are hollow. The structure is still the structure. Just like, you know, if the town hall is gutted by a fire, the girders and the walls are sort of still there, but there's nothing inside. That's about what... But on the other hand, I've just said, at the level of the people and many of the priests, there is still faith there. You can't just write off the whole novice order. If you can't just write off the whole novice order, still less can you just write off the whole society by the tenth. But if you've got eyes that see clearly, you can see the mortal danger. Archbishop Lefebvre was in Canada, I think in 1984, and somebody, when Father Emily was district superior, and somebody asked him the question, <coughs> should we go to the novice order mass? And the archbishop said, his answer was, I leave to everybody the responsibility for his own acts. You've got to make your own choice in your circumstances. But, he said, one thing I can tell you, by going along with a new religion, England lost the faith at the time of the Reformation. There were far too many Englishmen that just went along, and they lost the faith. So maybe they were making a considered decision in their circumstances, but they weren't taking into account the poison. Maybe these good priests in the SSPX today are still are, are taking into account all kinds of reasonable circumstances why they should stay inside the structure, which is what they're doing. But are they taking into account the full danger of the, of the poison coming down from medicine? I don't think probably enough of them are. Pray that the Holy Ghost enlighten them that they need to get out if they want to get away from the poison. Yes, Your Excellency, I wanted to ask you this question because it's a question that um, I often um, am puzzled about. And the question is, um, if you read Bishop Fairley's writings from about maybe 12 years ago and before, they're very, very clear, they're very black and white, and his thinking is absolutely, or appears to be, crystal clear. Now, if you read um, the writings of Bishop Fairley today, yes. and you listen to the things he's saying today, yep. my question is, what happened to how you? could a man that was as clear as this, or seemed to be so okay. clear, so how did he end up in such confusion, or what it seems to be confusion, Yep. Where did the change come and why did it come? Well, that's the a good question. question. Is why? You're asking about a man, and God knows. All we have to go by is the exterior. God knows. On the interior, God knows. So we're just judging by the exterior. But there must be an explanation. Okay, let's try. My own explanation is that when the Archbishop started the society in 1970, 
He was 65 years old. And he started the seminary, and young men, youngish men, a number of younger men came towards him, and they're about 20. Um, in 1970, a 20-year-old was born in 1950, and he did spend his adolescence in the 1960s, which were a revolutionary decade. The 1960s turned a lot of things upside down. Okay. 20 years later, the Archbishop was still alive, 1990, young men coming to the seminary at the age of 20 were born in 1970. They were born after the 1960s. Easily most of the young priests in the society are post-1960s. That's a completely different environment from the Archbishop, who was born in 1905 before the First World War, when there was a certain amount of order still in the world. So the Archbishop was born because we're all highly influenced by the world around us. We are social animals, not just family animals. So, you know, a decent family is not enough to preserve a young man. He's, even if today a young man has got a decent family, he's living in a rotten society. Out of, it's out of his control. It's not his fault. It's not his control. But it's a rotten society. It's a rotten world. So, and, we, and that impin impinges on all of us. So the young men coming into the society were born in a world of disorder, whereas the Archbishop was born in a world of relative order. So the Archbishop had a certain structure in his head, certain values, certain certainties, which young men about past, after the 90s didn't have. Okay, these young men, let's say, followed the Archbishop like you've seen Mother Duck and Little Ducks on a Pond. The, a lot of the seminarians were in line, all following the bewitching Archbishop. He had charisma, he was bewitching, uh, he had sanctity, he was obviously Catholic, he was a spellbinder, and he was charming, you know. So, so the, the, the sweet little ducks, the sweet little ducklings followed the Archbishop, but they didn't get what he was really about. Because he was not only a falcon, a hawk of doctrine, he was also a, a dove, of, a pastoral dove. He was a doctrinal hawk and a pastoral dove, which is a very good combination. But if the little ducklings of the 1970s and 80s are following the pastoral dove, they're not getting the, the doctrinal hawk. But why did it sound like the web? Like if you listen to it... Would... Because the, they, they're imitating, the little ducklings are imitating every noise that Mother Duck makes. But it's not there. It, it's, it's there, but it's, not, it's was, not in the blood. Was it there with you, though? I'm, a, I'm an, an older creature. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I've got a lot of grey hairs. So why didn't Bishop Fairley then listen to you? Because after the Archbishop left, well, you were still an older person well, who had the stability of a... Some a people baby. think I'm an absolute pain in the neck. <laughs> 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 and maybe Bishop Fairley was one of those who thinks I'm a pain in the neck. But you didn't change what... No, did I didn't, because I was born in 1940, so my university came to an end in 1961, before everything began to break up. So I still have some of that old structure. That's the way I would put it. Uh, actually, there is another side of it, of course. The clash is between liberals and anti-liberals. And the, and the Archbishop, uh, the last years of his life... He read a famous book about 19th century Catholicism against liberalism by a certain French priest called Emmanuel Barbier. And as the Archbishop read that book, he said, this clash going on in the 19th century is exactly the clash that's going on today in the 20th century. The only difference is, then, the good guys were in control and the bad guys were on the outs. Middle of the, after Vatican II, the bad guys were in control and the good guys were on the outs. It's exactly the same clash. Exactly the same clash. So, Bishop Foley, in my opinion, is on the side of the liberals. Now, why did he switch from anti-liberal to liberal? Because the anti-liberalism was only imitation. Uh, there's, a, there's an expression in English, the hot seat, which I'm not seeing. It's only when you put somebody in the hot seat that you really find out what's inside him, right? It's only when he goes to the top that it really comes out what's inside him. 
None of us guessed before Bishop Foley went to the top that that, that was what was inside him. And that, that is what was really inside him. He had, it, he's made it clear that he's never really got hold of the importance of doctrine. He's not a doctrinal animal. He's a political animal. But surely he must know that he has contradicted himself. But surely he must know the way I used to speak and the way I used he's, to think he's, is now... He's, the he's, just like, he's just like Cardinal Ratzinger. Yeah. Yeah. The, the great doctrine of yesterday was magnificent for yesterday. Today is different. And so, he great. this is what, the, what Cardinal Ratzinger said at the moment. I greatly admire these magnificent documents, anti-liberal documents of the 19th century. But we're now in the 20th. So, these documents, the expression that Cardinal Ratzinger used was, these documents are a substantial anchorage in the past. But the ship of the church is going to, um, it dropped anchor with the, with Pashendi, the syllabus, these great novels, it dropped anchor, but the time came to pull up the anchor and moved on with Vatican II. In other words, Cardinal, Cardinal Ratzinger has no idea of Catholic truth. No idea. Sometimes Bishop Foley has no idea of Catholic truth. He thought he had. And if you talk to him, if he's talking to an audience of two and two are four, he will say two and two are four, absolutely and always. But if he's talking to an audience of two and two are four or five, he will say two and two are four, of course, but they can also be five. Depends on his audience. But isn't he now embarrassed because he knows that we know? Like I, don't, I don't think he's embarrassed. The society, the people in the society who heard the way that he used to speak, that's like having a fight. I don't, I don't think, I don't think he's embarrassed. But, but he knows that we all know that he's changed. He's, he, it, it, he hasn't changed. He is, he was in tune with the 1970s and 80s of the Archbishop. He's now in tune with the 1990s and 2000s of, of the move, the society moving with the times to get back into the church which is a problem that the Archbishop never solved. And I'm sure that our, the, the devil whispers in Bishop Foley's ear that he's going to solve a problem that the Archbishop never succeeded in solving. So why are the other bishops now following him and why are the older priests now following him? If that's the case, why, why is everybody going along? Is this not okay, the I think you've got to take it case by case. Uh, the two bishops are the most important. Uh, Bishop Tissier, I think, uh, God forgive me if I'm making a rash judgment, but I know him quite well. We would have worked together for several years, close together. I think he's a child of the 1950s. Now, that doesn't, he's a little younger than I am, but he's, he was a Catholic in the 1950s, whereas I was not a Catholic in the 1950s. It helps sometimes to be to have been a rotten Protestant. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Um, in French, they say a convert is worth two apostles. So, you know, sometimes it's a help. Um, so, I have no difficulty in believing these popes are popes because I never went in for unconditional admiration of the Pope or the Cardinals. And that's because I wasn't born and bred a Catholic. That's what it's so, but um, what uh, I think Bishop Tissier's motor purrs, purrs, turn on the engine and the engine, like a Rolls Royce engine, but the clutch doesn't work. In other words, the doctrinal motor doesn't go onto the wheels. Because he's got the doctrine all straight in his mind, but to have the doctrine straight in your mind and to have it in your blood are two different things. So, it, so uh, he, I don't think he sees that the doctrine that he's got is incompatible with, sta with going along with Bishop Foley. So what do you think is a case of courage? Because I think that well, he can see very clearly. Okay, but, but it takes he sees clearly. Maybe, maybe you can say it's courage. Apparently he answered, somebody, somebody said to him, you know, what about this? Why are you going along? He said... I don't have the strength of an Archbishop of Faith. Exactly. Je n'ai pas la carrure. Exactly. Carrure. That's what he said himself. Because why did he write the letter then? Why would he write 
Why did he sign that letter? Okay. 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 He wrote. He signed that letter as did Bishop Gallerato, because at that moment the, there was still a lot of clarity of mind in the inside the society, and there was quite a lot of opposition. And so the two, the Bishop Tessie and Bishop Gallerato, at that moment saw clearly. But then they went through the general chapter of nine, the chapter of 2006, July 2006, and that was a masterpiece of confusion by a master confuser. And Bishop Early is a master confuser. Do you mean 2006 or 2012? 2000, 2000, I beg your pardon, you're quite right. 12. 2012. The general chapter, of course, I'm sorry. The general chapter of 2012, yes. And it was a masterpiece of confusion. And... Um, Bishop Foley is like Paul VI. He's soaked in ambiguity. And he opens his... It, it, ambiguity is absolutely natural to him. Like Paul VI. And, in other words, in two and two are four, I completely agree. Two and two are five, oh yes, that's also... Two and two are five, to, to, to limit it to two and two are four, that's very narrow-minded. Two and two are four or five is more open-minded, is progressive, it's modern, it's creative, it's, uh, it's better than confining his strokes to two and two or four. The man has lost grip on truth, like Cardinal Ratzinger, like all of these liberals and all of these modernists. They no longer know what truth is. But don't you think that, for, sorry, for the, for the other bishops and the older priests who in the beginning could see... Yes. But because Look, they failed to act... Okay, there's a, lat there's a Latin saying... This will be about your last question for the moment. <laughs> if we have to stay on men until midnight, I'll stay until midnight. Uh, there's a Latin saying, Tempura mutan tu no set mutamara nilis. The times are either Bob Dylan. The times they are a changing. But the Latin adds, and we change with them. And people do change with the times. There are not all that many people who don't change with the times. And... The, uh, the, I'm, I mean, I knew all the veterans in the society. I was there with them at the time. I've known them all. And I don't know what's happened to them all. Uh, Bishop Gallerator, I'm afraid, God forgive me again for his rationality, he's a politician. And he's decided that the political thing to do for the moment is go with Bishop Foley. Uh, they, they've lost the truth. You've got to pray like crazy amongst your intentions to ask the Mother of God, ask the Mother of God with your 15 mystery rosary for a love of the truth, a love of the truth, and then access to the truth. If you love the truth, you'll look for it and find it. If you don't love it, you won't find it because it's a pain in the neck. It makes it very difficult to live in today's crazy world, the truth. So, so if you've got to want it, if you've got to find it. When you find it, it's extremely precious. It's well worth dying for because it's the royal road. But it's, a, it's difficult to live in today's world, knowing the truth. Because the world, is, the world we live in is a world of lies. Lies, lies, lies. Morning, noon, and night. The whole world is lying to itself. And you finger the lie, oh boy, people don't like it at all. I just need a, a practical explanation of the command book. There were four bishops, okay, four archbishop of the consecrated the four. We know what happened to you. And then there's three remaining. So uh, everyone addresses bishop, uh, bishop Filet, Bishop Filet. Is there, what is, is there some kind of authority? I mean, is he some kind of supernumerary? Uh, are you all, are the other ones equal players on the chest, but I just don't understand it. Okay, sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. There are two things. There's a hierarchical structure and there's orders. Orders means you're a layman or you're a deacon or you're a priest or you're a bishop. That's orders. Now, holy orders don't necessarily click with a hierarchy. You could have a superior general who was, who was just a priest. The archbishop insisted on that. Uh, that the superior general society could be a priest, doesn't have to be a bishop. The two things are different. So he consecrated four bishops, and he made it very clear at the time that the bishops were to be subordinate to the superior general. And the superior general at the time was a, was a priest, Father Schmidberg. Four bishops were to obey a priest, not as bishops, but as members of the society. And then as bishops, 
They would go around the world doing what bishops do, which is mainly ordaining and confirming the two things that priests don't, don't normally do, or can't do. Okay? So the two things are different. Uh, in the society, Bishop Philip got elected and then re-elected, which meant that he had both high orders and high position. The two things are actually different. In him they coincided, which gave him special clout. And then that special clout he used, he came out, what, what was inside him came out, and what came out was a liberal. He was in a position to rule, and he ruled, and I say it's only when a man gets to the top that you see what's really inside him. Spanish proverb, close your ears if you don't want to be shocked. It's only when the monkey climbs up the tree that you see his behind. <laughs> Um, Bishop Tissier and Bishop Gallerata are both deliberately choosing to obey Bishop Foley. Is he the superior general? Bishop Foley, of course he's the superior general. I thought Von Schmidger was. Well, that's ways back until 19, what was it, until 1994. 1994, 1994, 1994 Bishop Foley was elected for the first time. 2006, he was re-elected the second time. And that made him the superior general? Yes. That's what the election is about. Because when I went to Syracuse, Father Schmidberger was talking about going with Rome. Yes. Yes. He's, he's, he's one of the, what I'd call the gang at the top. They want to go in with Rome. Bishop Foley, Father Schmidberger, Father Duchala, Father Laws, uh, Father Nelly, uh, Father Fluger. Are there any Americans in this room? No. No. No, there aren't. Because the, the Americans have not. The, in, here, over here, they chose. Bishop Foley has put Frenchmen in at the top. So that he's putting French liberals to make sure that the French liberals would pull the Canada and the United States in his direction. He didn't have uh, obvious American candidates because the American candidates were not all that liberal or weren't liberal enough. But Father Rostow and Father LaRue. And Father Okay. We have to lock up. So... They, if we don't want to quit, they'll have to lock us all up. <laughs> Sorry? Who votes for the general? The general chapter, which is 40 priests, and it's the superior general who chooses many of the members of the general chapter. So it's a vicious circle. The archbishop didn't see it or wanted to make sure that the superior general would have considerable power so that he wouldn't be undercut and democratized. Okay.